Here's a very simple and clever way to think about the supply and demand problem that was developed by a Dallas geologist named Jeffrey Brown, which he calls the export land model. Suppose we have a hypothetical country that produces 2 million barrels of crude a day, but that is declining at 5% a year. We'd note that they'd be able to export 2 million barrels, and then after 10 years, they would still be able to export 1 and a quarter million barrels a day. This seems manageable. But now suppose that this country uses oil themselves, as all countries do, and they are consuming 1 million barrels a day, and this internal demand is itself increasing at 2.5% a year. This is also reasonable. What happens to exports under this model? They go to zero in 10 years. Where we expected exports, we get nothing. This is the miracle of compounding, but in reverse, where exports are eaten into from both ends. It turns out that this is a very realistic scenario because we can already observe that production is declining even as demand is increasing in a number of countries. In the case of Mexico, currently the number three supplier of oil exports to the U.S., production declines and demand growth will entirely eliminate their exports by the year 2011 or 2012. Now, where in the world is the U.S. going to find a brand new number three oil supplier in the next three to four years? When world production will peak is a matter of some dispute, with estimates ranging from right now to some 30 years away. But as I said before, the precise moment of the peak is really just an academic concern. What we need to be most concerned with is that day that world demand outstrips available supply. It is at that moment of crossover that the oil markets will change forever and probably quite suddenly. First, we'll see massive price hikes. That's a given. But do you remember the food shortages that seemingly erupted overnight back in February of 2008? Those were triggered by the perception of demand exceeding supply, which led to an immediate export ban on food shipments by many countries. This same dynamic of national hoarding will certainly be a feature of the global oil market once the perception of shortage takes hold. When that happens, our concerns about price will be trumped by our fears of shortages. In order to understand why oil is so important to our economy and our daily lives, we have to understand something about what it does for us. We value any source of energy because we can harness it to do work for us. For example, every time you turn on a 100-watt light bulb, it is the same as if you had a fit human being in the basement pedaling as hard as they could to keep that bulb lit. That is how much energy a single light bulb uses. In the background, while you run water, take hot showers, and vacuum the floor, it is as if your house is employing the services of 50 such extremely fit bike riders. This slave count, if you will, exceeds that of kings in times past. It can truly be said that we are all living like kings. Although we may not appreciate that because it all seems so ordinary that we take it for granted sometimes. And how much work is embodied in a gallon of gasoline, our most favorite substance of them all? Well. If you put a single gallon in a car, drove it until it ran out, and then turned around and pushed that car home, you'd find out. It turns out that a gallon of gas has the equivalent energy of 500 hours of hard human labor, or 12 and a half 40-hour work weeks. So then how much is a gallon of gas worth, would we say? $4? $10? If you wanted to pay this poor man $15 an hour to push your car home, then we might value a gallon of gas at $7,500. Here's another example. It has been calculated that the amount of food that the average North American citizen consumes in a year requires the equivalent of 400 gallons of petroleum to produce and ship. 400 gallons of petroleum per person per year just for food. At $4 a gallon, that works out to $1,600 of your yearly food bill being spent on fuel, which doesn't sound too extreme. However, when we consider that those 400 gallons represent the energy equivalent of 100 humans working year-round at 40 hours a week, then it takes on an entirely different meaning. This puts your diet well out of the reach of most kings of times past. Just to put this in context, as it is currently configured, food production and distribution uses fully two-thirds of our domestic oil production. This is one reason why a cessation of imports would be, shall we say, disruptive. Besides the way that oil works tirelessly in the background to make our lives easy beyond historical measure, oil is a miracle in other ways. In this picture, a typical American family was asked to cart out onto their front lawn everything in their house that was derived from oil. 
That's quite a sight. How easily could we replace the role of oil in our style of consumer-led, growth-based economy? Not very. We currently use oil mainly for transportation, sitting right at around 70% of all oil consumption. The next biggest block is for industrial purposes, followed by residential, which means heating oil. This last tiny little sliver? That's oil used to generate electricity. With the exception of biofuels, which I'll get to later, all renewable energy resources either provide heat or electricity, meaning that even if we entirely replaced all of the electricity and heat currently provided by oil with renewables, we'd only be addressing these tiny slices right here. And in the industrial processes, oil is the primary input feedstock to innumerable necessities of life, such as fertilizer, plastics, paint, synthetic fibers, chemical processes, and flying around. When we consider other potential fuel sources, we find that they are mostly incapable of fulfilling these needs. Biofuels and coal could potentially fill some of these functions, but certainly not without a massive reinvestment program, and not anytime soon. So let's review a few key facts. You have to find oil before you can produce it. And key fact number one here is that world oil discoveries peaked in 1964. U.S. discoveries peaked in 1930, and 40 years later, production peaked. We are now 44 years after the global discovery peak. That's a fact. Key fact number two is that world production of conventional crude has been flat for the past four years, even as prices have increased by 140%. Taken together, key facts number one and number two suggest the possibility that peak oil is already upon us. If true, then we are going to wish with all our hearts that we had begun preparing for this moment a decade or more ago. Key fact number three is that U.S. oil imports are the energy equivalent of more than 750 nuclear power plants, which is seven times as many nuclear plants as currently exist here, and nearly twice the total number of nuclear plants in the entire world. Key concept, number nine of the crash course then, is that peak oil is a well-defined process that is nothing more than a physical description of how oil fields age. We have literally thousands of studied examples under our belts, and this is not open to debate. Only when the peak might arrive is up for discussion. Mostly hidden from us in plain sight is key concept number 10. The amount of work that oil performs for you is equivalent to having hundreds of slaves. It is this work that makes our lives what they are, staggeringly comfortable by historical standards. The average middle-class life in Western society today would be the envy of most kings in times past. Key concept number 11 is that oil is a magical substance of finite supply but unlimited importance. This cannot be overstated. Transitioning from one fuel source to another is a devilishly expensive proposition, posing enormous challenges with respect to cost, scale, and time. Our species transitioned over many years from wood to coal because coal was a better fuel source. And we transitioned over several decades from coal to oil for the same reason. Nobody has been able to advance any candidates as our next source of energy. Technology is not a source of energy. It may help us to exploit our energy more efficiently, but it would be a big mistake to confuse technology with an energy source. And finally, what we need to keep a careful eye out for is the supply of oil being exceeded by demand. And this raises key concept number 12. Oil exports are being hit two ways, by rising demand, and declining production. This raises the prospect that the moment when the world's nations finally realize there's not enough oil to supply everybody may come much sooner than most suspect. Exponential functions are hard for most humans to grasp, and oil exports are being exponentially squeezed in two directions, subjecting them to a surprisingly high rate of decline. And this completes an immensely brief tour through peak oil. If you've not already done so, you owe it to yourself to become knowledgeable on this subject due to its unequaled importance. I have links aplenty on the essential books, essential articles, and resources pages of my site. In the next section, we will discuss the intersection between energy and the economy, and I will make the point that it was no accident that our exponential, debt-based money system grew up at precisely the same moment that a new source of high-quality energy was discovered that proved capable of increasing exponentially right alongside it. Please join me as I explore the importance of energy to our particular economic and monetary systems in Chapter 17b, Energy Economics. 
Thank you for your attention.